Welcome to Dig Deep, the mining podcast. In this podcast, we go deep into mining news, hot topics, and live interviews with mining professionals and leading figures in the mining industry. Introducing your host, Rob Tyson, founder and director of Mining International and Mining International Executive, a leading global mining recruitment and headhunting agency. Hi, mining community. Welcome back to another episode of the Dig Deep, the mining podcast. And today's guest is Jamie Strauss, who's the founder of Digby, who are an ESG and data platform for the mining industry. And their data and ESG ratings are used by investors and other stakeholders uh, for the same reason. Uh, Jamie's an entrepreneur CEO for the mining sector uh, with over 30 years experience uh, within finance and is a seasoned independent director of listed companies uh, in the past. Um, he has extensive experience, um, which has expired, inspired him to discover software solutions to provide unique ESG disclosure platform for the mining industry. Um, and he's here today to tell us a little bit more about his journey, how Digby has developed as a company and what they're looking to achieve in the ESG and mining space. That's welcome, Jamie, to the podcast. How are you doing, Jamie? Good afternoon. Thank you. Nice to see you, Rob. Yeah, and yourself. Appreciate your time. Um, and I know you're uh, busy writing a, a speech for a, a dinner that you're attending to tonight. So, um, like I said, really appreciate your time. So, wonder if you can tell us or tell the audience a little bit about yourself, about your, your career and your background uh, before we uh, speak more, a little bit more about Big Big. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, as you said, I've spent 30 odd years in mining finance, um, based largely out of London, but uh, been in big banks like Sockgen and Bank of Montreal. Uh, I set up BMO's London equities office. Um, I've done my own thing. I've sold them like uh, uh, the one I had, I sold to Hargreaves, uh, to, uh, to Bank of Montreal. Um, and I've been an independent director uh, for a number of different companies and still retain that, actually. I thoroughly enjoy that. I still retain uh, being a, a member of the board of Altius, Mem uh, Altius Minerals, which is the Canadian uh, royalty and streaming uh, uh, business and project generation business. Um, and I set up Digby uh, about six years ago, but really focused on ESG since 2020, uh, when I was approached by Evie Hambro from BlackRock and uh, Mike Barton from Orion to set up uh, a ESG solution for the mining industry to understand or to uh, to address some of the issues that were going on and still going on to some extent uh, today. So I just wonder if you can just tell us a story about obviously Digby once obviously once Finchie set it up to sort of where it is today. Yeah, so. Um, it was originally based, uh, we originally had a research platform, but actually uh, on even before that, we had a database. And the database is actually a free database. It's really good for any of your listeners. It, it's completely free. It's got 1,500 different projects around the world, development projects, all with the economic studies there from PA through to full feasibility. Uh, as I said, it's freely available, about 80 data points for each, each one, uh, geographically identified highlighting where producing mines are nearby. It's a real treasure trove of, uh, of, of data there. Uh, unless I think you spend 20, 30, $40,000 with you know, major data companies, you can't get that information and we put it out for free. But in, from our point of view, that's the spine of the business. Uh, that's the creation of the mining, shall we say, network around the world. Um, and we, when I got encouraged to do the ESG uh, for uh, a platform, uh, we really had to try and address three things. That's what BlackRock, Orion, and I uh, agreed after three or four weeks of talking. And really it was, it was to uh, remove confusion. You know, what does a mining company need to disclose when it comes to ESG? There are 30 odd different topics. It's a complete mess in terms of the total number of global standards. And everybody's confused what you need to disclose. So help these companies navigate their disclosure so that it can help them internally and also externally. Make sure that there is um, uh, standardization so that the stakeholders you're talking to and primarily we're, on this show we're really talking about shareholders um, but it could also be communities uh, it could be local government and others but 
how do they get that information so that they can easily and simply use that? And then thirdly, to provide a communication platform which, um, um, which allows that credible independent assessment, which we've gone through, to then be communicated to all those different stakeholders. We launched that about a year and a half ago. We have 25 or so different customers. Uh, I think this month's gonna be a record month. We'll get five or six new customers in over the line this year, this month. Um, and really, you know, I think this industry has had a bit of a tough time in the last year with finance and balance sheets. Uh, there clearly seems to be increasing focus now by developers and producers. Uh, and I'm sure that the explorers, when they get refinanced, uh, are beginning to see the benefits of uh, really putting in ESG early on in their whole strategy so that they can prove they've got a sustainable operation to come and therefore get premium pricing or green premiums, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned, obviously, there's 30 topics. What are the top few topics that you can, I suppose, go in a little bit more detail? Um, and I suppose some of the topics where mining companies tend to not pay too much attention to, but you feel they should do. Yeah, I mean, do bear in mind that most mining companies are actually good social citizens, and we've been doing this for a long time. The difference in the last few years, Rob, is we've now got to disclose it. Um, but to me, that's an opportunity. That is not a compliance issue. It's not a regulatory issue or anything else like that. This is a massive opportunity for the industry. Massive opportunity. We are the worst perceived sector on the planet. We have the highest cost of capital on the planet. We've got an opportunity from coming at the bottom of the grave to going up there and winning hearts and minds of society. And we've been doing a lot of this stuff for years. Now, it's changing, it's evolving. We've got more obligations or whatever it happens to be. Maybe it needs to be better quality data or whatever. But if we can provide this information in a standardized way, and coming back to your point, look, everybody knows about GHG emissions, but how relevant are GHG emissions as an explorer? Not that relevant. But for a developer, they're really important. Not so much of what their GHG emissions are that day, but where's that mine when it's built in uh, three months or three years time, is that where's that gonna sit on the curve of GHG emissions? Because that's impacting the value of the product that they will be selling. And if they don't get on top of that early, then uh, they can't expect and continually improve, by the way. It's not a binary number that can continually improve through technology or changing of different uh, processes or whatever. So getting on top of that early is important. That's the big one in the elephant uh, in the room. Biodiversity. You know, we ground up the ground. You know, whether it's an underground mine, you've got to open it up somehow. Uh, we've got to put a processing plant somewhere. All of this comes down to biodiversity. There was an article actually on Bloomberg the other day, uh, or this morning actually, talking about biodiversity potentially even becoming bigger than GHG emissions. So um, uh, biodiversity, how are you going to get to nature positive? How are you going to mitigate impact? How are you going to ensure that whatever impact you are going to do can be improved or replaced elsewhere? What is the, what is the process post-closure by ensuring that that uh, mine uh, is is reconstructed uh, or rehabilitated effectively. Look at what De Beers is doing in Canada, the old Victor mine, and you can almost not see the mine anymore. And it's won great awards for that. Great example for this industry in terms of rehabilitation. And it doesn't just come down to rehabilitation. Going on from your question, Rob, is how can we make sure that that local community, if there was one, then has an ongoing livelihood uh, and thriving business post-closure? not just relying on the mine. So local procurement, making sure that there's housing, there's education uh, in some parts of the world where that's needed, uh, making sure that there's job security, uh, making sure that not everything relies on the mine. So when it's opened, it's good, but when it closes, it's bad. Trying to make sure that we have an ongoing lifestyle. This industry is aware of this. This is not a surprise. There's, uh, what we now need to do is to try and communicate this in a better way so that we can encourage new, uh, well, frankly, improve perception. That's the key. But if we can improve perception at community levels, then that, and we get investment at community level, then we can get governments on side, maybe turning mining to a vote win rather than a vote loss in throughout the world. Um, and if that community can be encouraged to be partners with that mine, 
And the government is excited with that and want to see further inward investment like we're seeing in Tanzania at the moment. Then you can begin to really change that dynamic in mining. And if we can do that, what happens to the situation with regards to valuation? We're gonna see increased investment in the mining industry. We're gonna see new money going down to exploration. We're gonna see new development. We're gonna see a cost of capital going lower, not going higher. Then we got new valuations for this industry, which begins to excite management and people can work for something more than just, uh, you know, getting a 10 bagger by finding a, a, a copper mine or a gold mine. Uh, you mentioned improved perception, and I suppose that comes down to, or partly comes down to branding and maybe branding of, of the industry. And obviously I get a number of different guests on and occasionally this kind of, this subject comes up uh, around branding of our, of our industry. And obviously out there, the mining, the mining brand, I suppose, doesn't sit well with a lot of people. Now, Obviously, through ESG, we can improve that branding. What would you say some of the main points and topics could be to improve, can be used to improve mining as a brand um, to obviously improve, improve that globally? Uh, this is actually quite a big question. I'm going to try and synthesize it down to two little things. You know, on one side of it, which covers really probably most of the companies that you talk to and everything, it's trust. Simply trust. Trust with communities, trust with governments, trust with investors, trust with other stakeholders. And that is a brand. Trust is a brand. The industry doesn't carry much trust. But we do have brands within our industry. Look at Robert Friedland. I would call him a brand. He delivers. So why should we only look at the negative of this industry. There are new management teams who we're seeing at Digby who are embracing this new world of sustainability because they know it's going to work for the valuation of the company, for reducing mitigation, uh, sorry, reducing conflict with local communities by improving biodiversity and ultimately having better trust within its whole stakeholder world. It also mitigates risk, which obviously therefore helps management, or sorry, helps management boards, but it also helps the investors in their portfolios. The second part of it is branding of products. And I think this is probably where maybe you were going to originally, but I think actually the bigger picture here is trust of the industry. And ESG is the single biggest gift this sector has received in our lifetime, because we can measure, manage, and communicate standardized ESG related things going back to those 30 topics and that will begin to encourage that trust to come back into the sector. But the products, there's already different products and brands. The LME have a number of different uh, products and brands which are traded through their system. Um, but the key product which is going to evolve out of this is the green and uh, the green metal. And Kabanga, which is reversing into uh, life, uh, life zone metals in, in, on, on the NYSE, uh, the CEO uh, recently highlighted that the not enough money has gone into green, green metals. And green metals, whether it comes at a premium or whether or not there's just, just avoiding discounts, everyone has to be aware that the sustainability journey starts from the, start from the exploration stage and goes all the way through to production and then ultimately down that supply chain. So what we need to do to improve the brand of mining is to have green materials coming out of the ground. Green materials is the problem with the problem with the word sustainability or green is there's no clear definition. But the point is, how is it operated? Um, what was the corporate culture of that company in terms of mining that uh, product? What was the uh, how did they engage with their local community? Was there support for it or was there conflict? This industry doesn't have a great record. It has a bad legacy. But there's been a general improvement of trend over the last 20 years, even though it's been bumpy at times. And the new management teams who we're seeing are embracing this and are seeing the benefit in their share prices, in their cost of capital, with their access to capital. 
and we're only just touching on the surface of this at the moment. The opportunity for this sector, whether it's the developers to get lower cost of capital for development, whether it's producers uh, who are able to get a better rating in the market because mining is going to attract more secondary market uh, activity. All of that will flow down ultimately if we can get this going to explorers to have more investment and therefore provide more opportunities for the explorers as well. So it's upon us all really, I suppose, to improve the brand of mining, uh, the word mining, and to offset that reputational risk, which is so big at the moment. Obviously, ESG has talked a lot about in the mining industry, um, but why is, it, why is ESG so important for the mining industry and for mining companies to get to, to actually get it right? Yeah, well, I'll start off with a statement. 45% <laughs> of the global economy is driven by the mining sector. 45%. It's the top of the supply chain. So if we don't get mining right on a sustainability basis, it's very difficult for the rest of the world to really follow suit. So one of the things I would say is that the mining sector and why ESG is so important for the mining industry is differentiation. And differentiation is important because the mining industry at the moment, this is one of my points tonight in the, in the, in the dinner, the mining industry relies entirely on the cycle of the commodity market in order to make it success. It has become completely oblivious to the other opportunities which can help itself. So, PDAC 2023, Daniel Davidson, MIT professor and managing director uh, of the uh, Bill Gates and um, uh, Jeff Bezos Fund uh, Breakthrough Energy, I think it's Energy Breakthrough Technologies huge person in the VC world, stood up and said, imagine putting a decent sized mining company, which has no legacy, embracing ESG, which has critical minerals, which is producing. What would it be valued at? Just no legacy. There's no historical legacy, embracing ESG, critical minerals. Probably 15 times is what he said on, an, on a cash flow basis somewhere around 12 to 16 times, something like that. That's three times higher than the current valuation of Rio Tinto and BHP. The opportunity to differentiate the sector from within and to change the valuation of this sector through measurement, management, and communication of ESG metrics, which has been going on for some time, but now we've just got to disclose it, is so big that we've not woken up and seen it. It's literally in our face in the mirror and we're still focused on the big cycle of critical minerals and gold and all the rest of it. Wonderful, I'm the greatest believer in all of that. But we have no control over that, Rob, none. And frankly, how many in your lifetime, how many of these big trends take much longer to, uh, to, 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 to materialize uh, than we all hope and expect them to? So let's focus on what we can do and let's hope we get the cream of that as well when it does come. Yeah, certainly. So how can ESG data benefit mining companies and also obviously investors as well? Well, first of all, let's, uh, uh, ESG, is, um, ESG covers about 30 odd different topics. Um, most of which are day-to-day -day things that the mining industry is doing every day. I mean, it's not, it's, it's not a completely novel uh, new thing. Um, people want to put it into the, into the bucket of compliance. It's, it's not compliance at all. Um, we've been doing this, it is permitting. So to some extent, there's a bit of compliance there. Now we just need to communicate best, uh, best practice and, and, and strive for best practice around the world. So therefore we can raise confidence. Um, it can benefit mining companies because first of all, it can mitigate risk. It can mitigate risk because you're, if you are well-structured, and there's plenty of evidence on this, not just in the mining industry, but wider afield the better rated companies under an ESG lens tend to be lower risk companies. So that helps the management and it helps the boards mitigate their own risk. Secondly, it also helps the portfolio managers mitigate their risk, which is their primary job when it comes to running a portfolio. Um, if we do that, we can raise trust as well. 
but we've already seen a lot of this data. Look at the health and safety sector, uh, health and safety in the sector. We've already seen substantial reduction as a result of significant improvement of practice over the course of the last 25 years. Permitting, how can it help? How can ESG help permitting? Look at First Tin recently um, in Germany. It's had its permitting uh, accelerated as a result of sustainability uh, uh, items. Um, having a smaller footprint, basically that's a reduced reduced risk. I mean, if we've got a smaller footprint, then obviously um, you've then got less to worry about. Um, you can probably reduce operating cost. Uh, obviously every mine is different, so I can't talk generically on everything, but um, so the benefit of ESG is lower risk. It's better transparency, which reduces conflict. It raises confidence and ultimately can therefore have an improved valuation cost of improved cost of capital and other things going with it. But also we mustn't forget recruitment. We've got a terrible problem in this industry. We cannot recruit good talent. People, good, good quality talent tend not to go to sectors which are not that inspiring. So if mining is regarded as a dirty business which you don't want to have anything to do with, how many, how many of the good people are we going to get? I don't want to, I don't want to put down the people, the wonderful people we've got in our industry already, but we want to try and further and improve the pot and therefore uh, breathe fresh air into this industry, which has been on a, frankly, on a, on a trend line downwards for, 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 for decades. You know, look at this, look at the, it comes back to your question, look at the um, pool of capital that we're working with. It's been shrinking ever since I got involved in this. Maybe it's my fault. <laughs> um, we need to, <laughs> but look at the new pools of capital, you know, impact funds, um, ESG orientated funds. The last two or three years, look at how many funds, normal funds, generic, traditional managed funds have become a greener shade of where they were, regulatory wise, a huge number. We're gonna see $35 trillion worth of ESG orientated money by 2026, according to PwC. That's a headwind for this industry at the moment. Because anybody that was a fund that could invest in mining and wants to now become green, they're not going to put mining in on day one. It works against them. But imagine if we turn around that reputational risk of the word mining through measurement, management, and communication of all of these things. And people can suddenly see mining as doing great things for local communities or great things, you know, mitigating the risk on, uh, um, on environmental and biodiversity things, improving water, improving housing, education with local communities, and of course, producing the critical minerals of the future. If we can present that and people begin to believe in us, then the pools of capital suddenly start to become attracted to the mining industry. And we're already seeing evidence of that, by the way. This is not something in the distant horizon which we're hoping for and crossing our fingers for. I speak to impact funds. They're circling this sector. They want to invest in lithium and copper and graphite and other things. But the reputational risk to them is huge. We've not done ourselves a favor in the past. We now need to get over that. So there are so many benefits that ESG can do. And where we be begin to take back control ourselves as a sector and as a company, where we can get on top of this. Um, uh, you mentioned obviously mining has been described as a dirty business and obviously that goes with obviously the branding um, but you're also indicating that it's we can be a leader in ESG. Um, I don't see ESG funds impacting investors getting involved so how do you close that gap? Yeah it's look it's a trust game it's a trust it's removing reputational risk and it's not going to happen overnight you know let's not but the beta is so big here you know that i think the industry is about a trillion dollars in total it's what is it two percent of the total s p um but rob look at this industry at the moment you know everybody's thinking it's going to go on a cracker you know because of the critical minerals and the gold industry and everything but we can't get the talent we can't um, you know, we've got a high cost of capital. We've got, you know, we're, we're unloved. We're the worst valuation. We're everything under the sun is against us. And in reality, let's stop looking at what might be as a result of something we can't do. And let's start to work on things that we can do to attract these new pools of capital into the sector. We need to advance products. Like we need to have 
sustainably linked debt, which relate to ESG, uh, things like that, so that the banks can work around a structure so that uh, if a project wants to get debt on a specific thing and can help a local community, there are KPIs and everything which relate to that, which will affect the coupon of the of that underlying bond or debt uh, product. Um, there's so much we can do um, to help remove reputational risk, therefore raise the um, or shine a spotlight on those management teams that are embracing ESG. Uh, demonstrating things in a transparent way so that they can attract that. Um, so I, I'll, I'll tell you something which is very surprising. Um, it's some data that we're just working with Peel Hunt actually with at the moment. Um, the mining sector is in the top quartile of ESG, of, of sectors out of 20, is in the top quartile of sectors when it comes down to ESG. So something's not happening. You said, how can we close the gap? How can we close the dots? The data's already there. If there's more money going into sustainability and the sector is already in the top quartile, and that shouldn't be a surprise given the programs going back 20 or 30 years in this thing, how can we How can we be so far off the mark by having the highest cost of capital and one of the lowest valuations? Communication. We've just got to communicate more effectively, provide standardized data that is trusted, ideally through a third party, showing measurable improvement on the relevant areas of ESG whether it's governance, whether it's biodiversity, whether it's social, whether it's whatever it happens to be. And if we can do that, we will earn the credibility that this sector is justly deserving. And it will pull the best management teams who are embracing ESG up into that fold and will differentiate from a valuation point of view those that are not. It has to, the data speaks. Everybody wants to be, I say everybody, a lot of people want to be involved in, in mining uh, because of the critical mineral story, maybe because of gold in some cases, but how do we bridge that gap to avoid that reputational risk with which they have, with, with, with which they suffer at the moment? Yeah, there certainly is a lot of challenges and obviously you mentioned recruitment, uh, which obviously I'm in recruitment and I'm aware of those obviously challenges, um, but how can, Digby support some of these challenges they're facing and close that gap? Yeah, so if you just go back to what we developed, so uh, um, remove confusion, standardize, raise credibility and uh, communicate. So those are the four tenets, so to speak, of doing it. So if you just quickly, for your, for your listeners uh, or viewers, um, what did we actually put in place? So it's a mining specific set of frameworks that are right-sized. So exploration, development, and production. It's never too early to start exploration, uh, start ESG, even at the exploration level, uh, but it must be right-sized. We need to have it on a forward-looking basis rather than a backward-looking basis. So management can put out their aspirations as to where their mind wants to be. You know, maybe they want to do some solar in the future or, or whatever it happens to be. And uh, so they want, we need to be able to allow them to express where their aspirations are to become more sustainable. It's not always backward looking. And then we need to uh, make sure that we're um, using data that is aligned to those global standards. They're highly recognized. They have been very well thought out by millions of hours of people's work. Let's use that data to make sure that we have a sector specific set of frameworks, which allows all companies to disclose. So, We've done that, we've spent the money, we've done all that, and we provide those frameworks for free. So any of your listeners who happen to be mining companies and they're asking themselves, how can I disclose ESG effectively and get the reward for doing so and being transparent? Give me a call, they can onboard, there's no cost uh, uh, to that. It's only when you come to uh, uh, submitting for an independent assessment, so you can get access to that and we can help you on that basis. And then obviously going through the process of an independent assessment 
having standardized uh, data that is then going out and, and able to give observations to help that management, help that board. You know, these boards have huge obligations on ESG now. I think the UK, UK legislation or corporate governance legislation is you need to incorporate ESG at the point of decision-making process. Well, most of these boards don't have access to the information available to do that. So, because they never had to in the past. So let's get that into a way that they can easily, quickly address that and create a strategy behind it. I was talking to one company yesterday, an executive chairman of a company yesterday who's just set up a new sustainability, a small producer, just set up a sustainability committee. He's got a huge task ahead of him because he doesn't know what, what he's got to do, what he hasn't got to do. This just allows him to do it. So, and then has a structure and a, a, in which he can manage on an, on an annual or semi-annual basis as he sees fit. So uh, providing that, and then of course, uh, allowing them to communicate, Rob, to all of their different stakeholders. And we've concentrated on the investor world here, but uh, if you're a producer, less important for the, uh, for the lower end, but if you're a producer, your insurance sector needs to get the same information and hopefully reduce the cost of your insurance premiums. Equally, you want to engage and give uh, um, information to your local community to mitigate that conflict potential and raise their confidence as neighbors and as, as, as partners. So this is not solely investors, although they are the stewards of ESG, and therefore we should be listening and making sure that we give them information which is obviously relevant to them. Yes, yeah, certainly. And obviously we have a variety of listeners to this. So obviously we've got people in mining companies, whether they're junior miners, mid-tier, larger companies. We have service providers to the industry as well, um, as well as investors. So there's obviously a lot of information that you're providing that you, and you can provide to a wide range of people within the mining industry, which, and again, like I said, we have a lot of different, a variety of different listeners listening to this. So um, it's certainly something that these guys can take advantage of. Yeah, and I, sh I should say, with regards to your wide, your wide uh, 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 different types of uh, invest of listeners, you know, we're, we we want to collaborate. You know, the, the, in terms of the consultants who are helping this industry, uh, and with no disrespect to them, nobody was trained to disclose ESG. Nobody. There are a lot of very qualified ESG practitioners who can help these companies go from A to B, but nobody was trained to disclose ESG. So give us a call. We can provide your customers and you with these frameworks for free. We can help you make sure that you get your customers going from A to B and get rewarded for doing so as a result of having a positive journey. No fund manager cares about a score. What they care about is what's that journey? Are they embracing SG? Are they doing something about it? And we can then uh, work with them if there's areas of remediation or possibly... Um, uh, we don't need to work with them. They're just going down that track and we can support them because we know they're embracing it. Look at, uh, there's a company called Foran, not one of our customers, but Foran in Canada, the Canadian company, great copper asset, but look at their embracement of ESG right from the beginning. Look at Blackstone, one of our customers, absolutely straight out there, embracing ESG at the heart of it. Um, look at Kodiak. I mean, there's so many, go onto our website and see all the other companies. Uh, Kodiak have just completed it, uh, another copper company. Um, and all of these companies are embracing ESG. And now they've got to work, they've now got a work program in order to further improve on that. They're going to be differentiated between the others because that's where the money's going. You need to follow the money. Yeah. And, and I suppose the quicker you get ESG policies in place, and adopt it, the better. So obviously, whether you're a very small junior, early stage mining company that may have permitting, um, you could be a company like that, or you can be a fully, fully grown producer. I suppose the earlier you adopt ESG procedures and processes, the better. Yes, Rob, in principle, the answer is yes, but let, let's just break that down very quickly. Not every company is going to be triple A rated today and nobody cares about that. What they care about is they're embracing ESG and do something about it. Okay. So if in their first year assessment, you know, they haven't got a child slavery policy or whatever, it doesn't matter. 
lot of this is new. People shouldn't worry about that. What we're trying to do is just to identify the gaps so that the boards can feel comfortable that they do their job and the management can do their job and then we can communicate that more effectively and therefore you get differentiation uh, on it and you hopefully have less conflict and you get better valuation. So uh, the answer is yes, but people should not be afraid of this. It's, it's not a test. It's not a, there's no negativity around this if you're embracing ESG. And I don't suppose it's a work, in, work in progress as well. It's a journey. It's a journey. And look, you know, if you know, one of the great questions I like using is, you know, how do you power your site uh, at the moment? And most people will say diesel. How would you like to power your site in the future? Well, obviously, we haven't got a lot of money at the moment. We can't actually do an awful lot. But it is our aspiration within four years in the event that this uh, exploration and ultimately development goes according to plan that we want to put uh, solar in. And we want to be that to be 30% or 40% of our thing. And by the way, we'll be sharing 15% of that with our local community. There is an aspiration with which that management team can, can effectively lean into and then be annually assessed on that basis. So it's not a matter of have you got it all in place? Absolutely not. It's a matter of understanding where you are now where you would, some key areas that maybe you want to sort out over the course of the next few weeks with a policy or whatever happens to be, and ultimately having an aspiration to making sure that that project is considered sustainable in when it comes to effectively producing, uh, well, raising its finance for development and ultimately producing a mine which will hopefully fit it so that it can be regarded as sustainable and get the benefit of all of that. And summing up, lastly, what's the outlook for Digby, and I suppose also, is there anything else you want to share with our audience as a as a closing note? Yeah, I mean, the outlook for Digby, I mean, I think it's very straightforward, Rob, is that, you know, um, we've designed this with the investment community primarily for the benefit of all in order to change the mining industry. In order to have positive impact for the mining industry, with its communities, with its investors, with its debt holders, and with its other stakeholders. That's the goal. If we can communicate more effectively with them, which is, I think, very few people would disagree, whether it would be the, you know, the, the CEO of BHP to the smallest uh, uh, um, explorer, everybody, I think, seems to agree we haven't done a good job of communicating. So if we can effectively address that, if we've done something to allow this industry to communicate its message more effectively, and therefore begin to change perception of the industry. But in terms of more of the sum of the detail, is you know, there's gonna be a lot more, uh, do I call it tech innovation within the Digby uh, portal. So already we have a huge communication capability, but there are certain things which we're missing at the moment. So uh, peer comparison, benchmarking, other stuff like that is all natural stuff that we're in the process of developing which will allow not only investors and other stakeholders, but equally the mining companies to begin to differentiate themselves more effectively. Uh, we're trying to help, um, uh, I won't go into too much detail, but we're trying to help the service sector uh, and the suppliers to the industry on other areas of ESG uh, have a sin single place with which they can effectively market that stuff to the different industry and therefore help the ESG journey by bringing uh, knowledge and, and, and information available uh, to the mining industry. So um, look, there's there's a whole list of other things coming on, which we'll, you know, we'll probably talk about over the time, but it is basically making sure we can help these management teams navigate ESG easily and ultimately communicating it credibly to raise trust, confidence, and 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 the benefits of all of that that comes with that like valuation. Yeah. <laughs> Jamie, really appreciate your time. It that it's very insightful and like you said it's a it's a journey and people may be scared of what what they may uncover just by looking into ESG and like you said companies have been doing this especially in the mining industry should have been doing this for a number of years uh, and like you said it just having a bit of disclosure in what they're doing um, and improving everything around ESG so in, in, a, in a standardized way in a standardized yeah. way with which investors and other stakeholders can get easy access and can, um, can track and assess on an easy going basis. And, you know, you've got to take into all of these different investors, private investors, private equity guys, insurers, traditional funds, 
uh, debt holders, all of these people have slightly different nuance to the way they're going. Some of them just want to tick the box that they've seen it and this company is embracing. Some want to use it as a filter basis in order to make sure that they then go deeper and identify areas with which can be remediated. So one's got to take all of this into account and we've just got to make sure that that base data is validated, trusted, and ultimately put out in a standardized way. Yeah. So if our, any of our audience, which I'm sure they will, if they want to reach out to you, if they've got any questions and also access the, uh, the database and information that you've provided, how can they go about doing that? And how do you advertise? Uh, are you cross social media, and uh, the different yeah. platforms advertising what you're doing? Yeah, so LinkedIn is our main form of communication on the Digby page or my own page. Um, Digby has a, you know, Digby is based on a platform basis. So you can just go on to digby.com, uh, D-I-G-E, I'm going to start again, Rob, <laughs> D-I-G-B-E-E.com. And there's a contact us there. Um, so you can easily, and that's, that's looked at all the time. So just, just press the button and contact us. Um, or, you know, just get a hold of me on LinkedIn. Very, very happy to open. Uh, just send me a LinkedIn message. Yeah, we'll include those in the show notes for companies anyway. So uh, uh, I'm sure a lot of our audience will reach out to you if they've got any questions and obviously access the data as well, which I think is obviously going to be very useful to no matter who, wh what you do in the industry, because it's obviously all going to apply to you uh, one time or another uh, as we move forward. So um, Jamie, really appreciate your time. Um, audience, hope you found that very useful. Um, if not, you should do, because it's obviously gonna it's gonna play an important or more important part in the mining industry as we move further through this decade. So um, please take up Jamie's um, um, proposal of obviously accessing this data. Um, appreciate if you can share this episode amongst others in the industry. Um, it's definitely an episode that I think you should share amongst colleagues and other people that you know within the industry so they can gain this information as well and um, also people outside of the mining industry obviously if they if they can see what we're, the mining industry what we're doing trying to improve the image um, this information should not just go to people within the mining industry should go to people outside of the mining industry so um, well said. i could appreciate your, your uh, continued support and until next time happy mining Thank you for listening. Remember to reach out to Rob via the show notes and be sure to subscribe and leave a review. Until next time, happy mining, helping each other to improve the mining industry.